Study Center, and it's my great honor to be hosting Sharif Hakim Kudus today. Um, Sharif comes from a long line of very important um, Egyptian cultural producers, and um, he is extending that legacy and taking it to new heights. Um, so we're really, really honored to be featuring him alongside the Department of Journalism and Mass Communication today. His talk is entitled, Egypt's Struggle, the Revolution, the Political Elite, and the Security State. Um, just a couple of words about Shaheed. He's an independent journalist. Um, he's based in Cairo. He's a correspondent for the independent TV radio news um, station called Democracy Now. He also writes regularly for The Nation. He's also a fellow at the Nation Institute. And in, in addition to being one of the really important journalists who are, uh, who've been, who have been reporting on everything going on in Egypt for the last couple of years, he's also um, been in Syria, in Gaza, in Bahrain, and in Iraq. So we're really, really fortunate to be hosting him today. Please join me in welcoming him. Thanks. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited here to speak. Um, you know, I've been covering the revolution, as Shadin said, from the ground uh, since January 2011. And in that time, I've given uh, a number of talks uh, in the United States about Egypt. But I have to say, this is probably the most uh, daunting audience I've had yet, because I can say anything I want abroad, but you guys actually know what's going on. Uh, so be gentle. So, Let's begin by just taking stock of where we are uh, as a country. It's been just over a thousand days since the revolution began. <laughs> Thousands of people have been killed, wounded, blinded, jailed in uh, a struggle over these past thousand days. What's been achieved? Are those who hold the most power any more accountable? Is there more equity in society? Is wealth more fairly distributed? Do we enjoy greater freedoms as citizens? If we come to answer some of these questions, it doesn't uh, paint a very encouraging picture at the current moment. It's clear the military is uh, firmly in control. Uh, it has established itself as the final arbiter of power in Egypt. Any notion of civilian oversight of the army has all but been extinguished. And the military is looking to enshrine its uh, political and economic privileges and autonomy in the new constitutional order. Uh, the head of the army, Fatah Sisi, is hugely popular. He enjoys almost cult-like status. And criticism of him uh, is nearly non-existent, and it's taboo. And anyone who does criticize him is demonized and uh, attacked. The security apparatus, the police force, is completely re-empowered. We have a strict curfew, uh, the first one that's been obeyed in Egypt, and uh, a state of emergency. We've also seen a huge uptick in political violence. So protesters over the past few months have been uh, killed and jailed in record numbers. There's a low level insurgency in Sinai and elsewhere. There's an increase in sectarian violence that's targeting the Coptic Christian minority. And the economy has been very hard hit, with the poorest suffering the most, and no good prospect of a recovery anytime soon. Now, the two sides that have led this latest political conflict, this latest crisis that we've seen in, over the past few months, the military and the Brotherhood, have played throughout the conflict a zero-sum game. And it's an equation that's based on a false binary, demanding that Egyptians have to choose between one or the other. Both of these institutions, the Muslim Brotherhood and the military, are defined by hierarchy, patriarchy, secrecy, mendacity, and a sense of their own superiority. Uh, both are juggernauts in the Egyptian body politic, that have heedlessly clawed away at Egypt's social fabric over these past two years, proving time and again that their own economic and political interests trump all other concerns. So if 
It's this false choice that we've been presented for so long in Egypt between Islamism or militarism. That the military says it needs to stay in power, to be in control, in order to push away and stave off the threat of the Islamists, who are painted with a wide brush as all being terrorists. The Brotherhood inversely repeats this equation and sees only the deep states and Mubarakists in the opposition to it. And I believe the revolution was precisely about breaking out of these binaries that are imposed on us from above. So in this latest crisis, the Brotherhood has been the primary target of uh, a severe crackdown by the security state uh, in, under the guise of a, a war on terror. Now, in the face of this assault, the Brotherhood is claiming for itself the mantle of the revolution as has almost every other political movement in Egypt since the revolution began. It's painting itself as having tried to reform the state through some legitimate electoral process, only to be overthrown in a military coup. But so let's take first a quick look at the Brotherhood's uh, political decisions and its policies uh, to get a clear picture of where they stood. Now, immediately after Mubarak's ouster, the Brotherhood formed a coalition of convenience with the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. And it did this in order to hold revolutionary aspirations and unfettered popular mobilization in check. The uh, popular mobilization was something that both the military and the Brotherhood wanted to control. And the uh, they also formed this pact in order to, they calculated it would be the quickest way to back the army's flawed transition plan in order for them to gain power. So Morsi's government and the Brotherhood, while it had a legislative plurality in the now dissolved parliament, pursued policies that were meant to restrict the right to assemble, restrict the right uh, to protest, restrict the right to form NGOs, uh, they spurned a draft law that would have guaranteed the right to form independent unions. They pursued neoliberal economic policies that showed no break from past policies that widened the gap between rich and poor in Egypt. They urged, actively urged the police to clamp down on dissent against their rule. In January of this year, Morsi fired uh, the interior minister, uh, Ahmad Gamal al-Din, who was blamed for not cracking down harshly enough on anti-Morsi protests. And he appointed Hamad Ibrahim, the current interior minister. Now, Ibrahim's harsher tactics became very quickly apparent when he oversaw what was then the most severe crackdown on protesters and campaign of arrests and torture uh, that began uh, on January 25, 2013 and lasted until March. Uh, you may remember people like Hamad Gindi, the 28-year-old activist who was tortured to death in a police camp, and many other cases of uh, youth being arrested, tortured, and the use of sexual abuse as well. When more than 50 citizens were gunned down by police in Port Said in January, Morsi's response, the elected president, was to go on television uh, to thank the police for their efforts and to urge them uh, I wrote this down, to urge them to respond to protests with the utmost firmness and strength. He even went a step further in March when he addressed uh, the Central Security Forces, a graduating class, the riot police, and he sought to turn history on its head with the farcical comment that the police were at the heart of the January 25th revolution. The very police force Ebn Merkezi, that shot and killed and blinded hundreds of Egyptians in the first few days of the revolution alone. So the Morsi government clearly wanted a brutal security sector. And this is the very security sector that is now targeting them with unflinching brutality. They're not seeking to reform the state, they're seeking to harness it for their own interests. Now, to be fair, the Brotherhood faced serious obstacles uh, to governing the country from the beginning. Uh, they faced an intransigent state bureaucracy, a politicized judiciary, a declining economy, 
and significant anti-Akhwan sentiment in Egypt, in the Egyptian public to begin with. They chose uh, to govern in a unilateral fashion. They employed a winner-take-all, majoritarian view of their electoral gains that alienated all pub political parties and figures across the political spectrum, including uh, their one-time allies, allies, the Salafi Noor Party. This prevented them from building any kind of trust outside of their traditional constituency. They opted not to engage in any uh, meaningful conversation with NGOs, civil society, and other stakeholders on any aspect of state policy. And they practiced varying degrees of identity <coughs> politics, uh, using very divisive religious rhetoric to further their own political goals. Uh, that even bordered on sectarian incitement against the Coptic Christian minority and even against Shia Muslims at one point. So during this brief time that they had uh, portions of the state in their control, Morsi and the Brotherhood engendered genuine, authentic, grassroots opposition to their rule. And this was manifested by, the, by the Morsi's own admission, 9,000 uh, strikes protests, and other actions throughout Morsi's year in office that were occurring throughout the country. And Morsi's opponents included a very broad swath of political and social movements that were often characterized by conflicting ideologies and grievances. So the people who were rising up against Morsi were revolutionary activists, uh, labor unions, human rights advocates, the Coptic Church, as well as former regime members, uh, Mubarak regime members, sidelined biz business elites, and the political opposition, uh, the, the flock of non-Islamist political uh, figures and parties that are often lumped together under this term liberals, which I think is an inaccurate term to describe them. The defining characteristic of liberalism is to embrace political pluralism and Many of these figures have uh, rejected that notion outright. So I usually just call them non-Islamists. Um, they're defined by what they are not. So this disparate opposition towards Morsi uh, began to coalesce in early May when a group of young organizers launched the Tamarut campaign. They began gathering signed petitions, uh, declaring a vote of no confidence in the president, and calling for early elections. That's all the petition. Uh, called for. And the movement, I think, because of its simplicity, quickly gained steam. Now there's been a lot of speculation about the origins of the Tamarut campaign and where they came from, and the involvement of uh, Mukhavarat and the security state in the movement. I believe that it began as an authentic grassroots movement. In late May, uh, as the campaign was really gaining steam, I went to a meeting at the Revolutionary Socialists, which is uh, a socialist group with a Trotskyist orientation that is uh, very vocal on the streets. It's small but vocal. And the Revolutionary Socialists had, had announced their backing of Tamarut, as had other big groups like April 6 and Cafe and so forth. And it was a small event, you know, about smaller than this, uh, with 30 people or so. And they had invited the group Tamarut's founders to come speak. So Mahmoud Badr was there, Muhammad Abdul Aziz, and Hassan Shaheen were, were there. Badr chose to focus in his opening remarks on the role of the military. Okay? So he recounted these various incidents of popular mobilization and resistance against the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces in 2011 and in 2012 that the Muslim Brotherhood did not take part in. And he uh, concluded by ruling out a role for the military in political life. He emphatically said, we, we don't give the military a role in politics. Five weeks later, Badr is sitting next to Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. As Sisi overthrows Mohammed Morsi, uh, there's helicopters in the skies and tanks in the streets. And since then, Tamarud has walked in lockstep with the military. They have uh, completely backed the army-led transition. They have cheerleaded the vicious crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood and the killing and jailing of its rank and file. And two of the founders, 
Mahmoud Bad and uh, Mohammed Abdelaziz sit on the 50 member constitutional committee that is redrafting the constitution. So the Tamarud campaign and the anti Morsi movement as a whole was genuine when it began, but it was successfully co opted by the military and the security apparatus. They saw an opportunity to ride a genuine wave of popular anger against Morsi and they took it. So the security state actively and enthusiastically supported the June 30th protest. If you remember, in the weeks, the final weeks leading up to the protest, uh, they were very actively on TV calling for people to go into the streets. We already saw the police putting uh, pictures of CC on uh, police vans. And uh, the rhetoric of the demonstrations had clearly been hijacked by members of the former regime and the security state. Now, there is no doubt, uh, for those of you who went down or didn't or just saw it on TV, that June 30th was a massive, massive protest. Uh, it was, many argue, the biggest day of demonstration that Egypt has ever seen. At the time, uh, in interviews, I called it a revolutionary moment. Okay? I thought it was large enough uh, to be disruptive to the status quo, and that revolutions are made up of moments of disruption like this. And that no one party could have orchestrated or driven so many people into the streets that it was a genuine uh, popular mobilization. But I was wrong in hindsight in an essential point. What happened on January 25th and January 28th, 2011 was revolutionary not because the act of just marching in the streets and the act of being in Tahrir. What was revolutionary in 2011 was winning the streets, was winning Tahrir. The revolution was in the battle to take the streets from the police. The police force that you know, doesn't uphold the law was there just to keep the regime in power. By contrast, June 30th, the streets were already conceded. The most powerful elements of the state, the military and the security forces, were supporting the protests. And in this way, they managed to, to co-opt this genuine and authentic movement. Now, among the most visible backers of Morsi's overthrow was Mohammed al-Baradai, a very respected figure amongst revolutionaries, especially in 2011, and uh, a Nobel Peace Laureate. And he appeared next to Sisi on the day of Morsi's overthrow. His reputation lent an important uh, sense of credibility and legitimacy to the army-led transition. Now, in the beginning, Baradai did not condemn uh, the <coughs> incommunicado detention of Morsi in an undisclosed location. He didn't condemn the closure of pro-Morsi uh, TV channels or sympathetic TV channels. But he was among the few politicians, and clearly the most prominent, who was actively and vocally calling for a political solution uh, rather than a forcible dispersal of the pro-Morsi sit-ins at Rabal Adawaya and the Nahda. For this, he was frequently, and for speaking out after the killings in, in Manasa and on July 8th at Palace of Kumburi, he was frequently accused in the media of being a traitor and of being a double agent. And he basically failed in trying to rein in the security state. Uh, and this came to its height on August 14th when they forcibly cleared the sit-ins and resulted in what Human Rights Watch calls the single bloodiest day in Egypt's modern history. And he resigned, as we know, just hours uh, into that clearing and left the country. Now, proponents, and many of them are these so-called liberal figures, of the military stepping in and taking charge, say that the army defend their, their choice by saying that the army had learned its lesson from uh, its rule in 2011, that it would not repeat the mistakes uh, of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces when they took charge of the country, and that they would now listen to the people and heed their demands. Now, if you remember, the army was very discredited uh, by its rule uh, by 2012. The massive protests on the first anniversary of the revolution, January 25th, 2012, were very big, and the clarion call of that protest was Yaskot Yaskot Hakmel Askov. 
And to some extent, in the run-up to the presidential elections, the public even began to dig into military and SCAF corruption. And this really goes to the heart of the matter. Uh, they started to peck at the elephants in the room, which is to view these ruling generals as a cast of military industrial tycoons who run a large percentage of the Egyptian economy using a conscripted labor force without any kind of accountability, transparency, or oversight. So I would say, yes, the military has learned its lesson, but not in the way we would have hoped. The military learned instead how to co-opt this popular mobilization and has emerged a much more formidable force. It cemented itself as the final arbiter of power in Egypt. We as civilians can play around and have elections and referenda, but if we get out of line, the military is going to pat us back into place. They now have massive public backing by any account, uh, backed by a wave of chauvinistic nationalism, and the security apparatus, the police force, uh, along with it, is, is uh, re-empowered. And we saw Sisi himself claim the mantle of orchestrating uh, popular mobilization on July 24th, when he called on the Egyptian public to go into the streets and give him a popular mandate on July 26th, and many did. And so the military says, and many believe, that they are a genuine reflection of the popular will. And to me, this is one of the most dangerous implications of what's happening right now. One of the, the biggest triumphs of the revolution was getting popular mobilization out of its cocoon and popular mobilization becoming this very potent force and it was an autonomous force. People went into the streets when they wanted to go into the streets. They protested when they wanted to protest. And time and again, since the revolution began, they forced those with their hands on power of the state to act. And this was most evident, perhaps, in the uprising in Mohammed Mahmoud of November 2011, when Tantawi, in the face of this uprising, delivered the first nationally televised address that he had given as head of the country, and for the first time uh, declared, uh, scheduled a date for a handover of power. Before that, if you remember, he was considering delaying presidential elections to 2013. But now the situation is very different, and the army enjoys unprecedented support. Uh, by all accounts, the security forces and the army have killed hundreds and hundreds of Egyptian citizens in Rabat Adawaya and Nagra and elsewhere. Uh, they've jailed thousands of Brotherhood rank and file. And all this is taking place to widespread applause by the public and by these uh, non-Islamist politicians and political figures. Now, these so-called liberals have a vested interest in eradicating their Islamist opponents and having the military do it for them because they've proven time and again that they cannot compete with them on the electoral playing field. And so they have an invested interest in getting rid of them. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a cult of personality that's been built up around the, the CC. His face is plastered on everything, on TV, on billboards driving to Sokhna, on chocolate. And the media has been completely taken over uh, by the pro-military narrative, a war on terror narrative. Uh, and this has sent millions of Egyptians running into the arms of the army, uh, seeking a security blanket, which is really a straitjacket. Now, members of the political elite, like Amr Musa, Hamdi Sabahi, and Hamad al Ghar, have all publicly endorsed the idea of Sisi running for president, a move that would he would win, I imagine right now, uh, and a move that would completely eradicate even the slightest pretense of civilian democratic control of the state. I mean, most people don't even know the name of our interim president, the almost comical figure, Adi Mansour. The committee that is uh, redrafting Egypt's constitution has proposed a transitional amendment that would protect the army from control of the president. That is their words. So that is enshrining military supremacy in the national charter. Uh, the chair of the committee, Amr Musa, is meeting with Sisi at the end of the week or the beginning of next week to discuss the clauses that have to do with the armed forces in the constitution. And it's very hard to imagine that Amr Musa is going to challenge Sisi or go against any of his wishes. 
Meanwhile, in this climate that we're in, anyone who speaks out is demonized. Uh, journalists and foreigners uh, have come under attack in unprecedented ways, especially foreign journalists who get uh, the, the double sword. Uh, uh, and uh, email came to all foreign journalists ordering that camera crews are now required to request permission before filming anywhere in the country. Uh, Syrian and Palestinian refugees have been scapegoated as Brotherhood allies and Morsi sympathizers. They have been uh, vilified in the media. They've been rounded up. They've even been shot at and killed while they're trying to flee Egypt uh, and take, embark on a very treacherous journey across the sea and killed. Uh, meanwhile, protests continue uh, by the self-styled anti-coup alliance. We saw uh, you know, three days of protests at, in the Lazhar recently, protests in Cairo University. There's clashes with security forces <coughs> on a daily basis. And we have this low-level uh, insurgency in the Sinai. It's very hard to understand what is happening in Sinai because it's very hard for reporters to get in there. And when they do, we saw what happened to a reporter who spoke out. Ahmed Abu Dharaq, who's a famous Sinai journalist who uh, works for Masri Lyom and helps many, many uh, foreign journalists when they go to Sinai, was uh, arrested and hauled before a military court when he wrote on Facebook that uh, a military strike that was ostensibly targeting militants in Sinai had hit a civilian area instead. And he, was, uh, he received a six-month suspended sentence to the end. Meanwhile, the Coptic Christian minority has been forced to pay the price of the state's brutality against the Islamists. And so we've seen churches, monasteries, Christian schools across the country attacked and looted. We have this latest horrific attack in Mbeba on a wedding, uh, which killed four people, uh, including two children, one 12 years old, one 8 years old. And this comes after months of uh, sectarian rhetoric by the Muslim Brotherhood and its civilian and its uh, Islamist allies. And despite these continuing attacks, the security forces do very little or next to nothing to protect uh, the Coptic Christian minority. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a state of emergency and a, and a strict curfew, and it's the first curfew that's ever been obeyed by Egyptians uh, since the revolution began. When there was a curfew in 2011, people went out at curfew time. When Morsi tried to institute a curfew earlier this year in the canal cities uh, in Port Said and Ismaili and Suez, people went out and started playing football games at 9 and chanting Yisa Tisha when uh, the curfew began. But this curfew is being obeyed. It's uh, damaging the livelihoods of millions of Egyptians. Uh, the cutting off of trains across the country has hurt people severely. And this comes after the rhetoric was that Rab al Adawaya Sitin is destroying the country. Uh, whereas the situation that we have now is, is arguably worse. Uh, the cabinet has also passed a protest law that would give the interior ministry, a very regressive protest law, that would give the interior ministry, the police, the authority to cancel, postpone, or move any protest uh, that it sees fit. And the only person who could overturn it is a judicial authority. But there has been a slight glimmer of hope in this, in that there was a groundswell a public hostility to this law, and even groups like Tamarud spoke out against it, and it looks like it will be uh, withdrawn or at least amended until we have a new uh, parliament. But this rhetoric of a war on terror and the political climate that we're living in is very dangerous, and many point to a return to the 1990s, where we had this uh, kind of uh, insurgency, a low-level Islamist insurgency with attacks on tourists, attacks on uh, the Christian minority uh, that was met with a very, very harsh crackdown by the security forces. And what that did was all but close down the space, the political space. And during that decade, we saw very little activism in Egypt, and it only really began to uh, open up in uh, the year 2000. So where are revolutionaries in all of this? And by revolutionaries, I mean those people who have consistently spoken out against the authoritarian nature of the state and those running it since Mubarak's ouster. So whether it be the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, or Sisi. Many of them did organize against Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood. 
And I would say a very small minority of them, in the run-up to June 30, became very ambivalent about the June 30th protests because they saw that the discourse and the rhetoric and the security states and the military had started to back this and something was amiss. But for the most part, uh, the ones I talked to feel they have been pushed out of the discourse, that they're on the sidelines, uh, watching this conflict between these two juggernauts play out between the military and the Muslim Brotherhood. In recent weeks, some of them have started to organize around specific issues, calling for a ban on military trials in the new constitution, uh, advocating for Syrian and Palestinian refugees who are being uh, demonized. But they refuse to join uh, the so-called Rabah protests or the pro-Morsi protests because they see the goals of those protests uh, as akin to the Brotherhood's goals, which they see as a wing of the counter-revolution. So this is where, broadly, we stand after a thousand days. And like I said, it's a, not a pretty picture. It's a very difficult time right now. Personally, I've not felt such a sense of foreboding since the revolution began. Uh, we appear to be heading towards a more regressive political order than the one we launched the revolution against in 2011. But I still feel that um, a fundamental change that the revolution uh, produced in Egypt was people's relationship to authority in the country. So after January 2011, Egypt felt like this new place where people would openly contest authority in so many ways, uh, with uh, arts, with humor, with protest, with solidarity, and finally with their, their bodies and their lives. And this is where the struggle for change, I hope, still lies. If you talk to someone on the streets, they may initially praise CC and praise the military or praise Morsi and praise the Brotherhood. But if you speak to them a little while longer about the issues, they often display a very deep political awareness of, uh, about the problems that are affecting them as citizens. And they speak in tones and language that implicitly challenges the status quo. So, as a society, we have been talking about politics and about democracy for the past two and a half years, uh, almost exclusively. And I, I can't help but think that uh, living in this state of flux and a state of possibility has changed us, somehow. And I hope that it's for the better and not the worse. So, to believe that the, the feeling of revolution is still there, no matter if it's buried very deep and it's hidden from us, it can't be, I hope, completely extinguished yet. So I'm, I'm waiting for Egypt to take me by surprise again, as it has over the past two and a half years, uh, in both positive and negative ways. And the refrain that uh, many people keep saying over and again is Iliat Sikhiana, despair is betrayal. Uh, and so we should try not to feel like traitors. Thank you, I look forward to your questions. Where did the money for it come from? 
how did we generate all this? And what does this tell us? Okay, so the, that's three questions. Uh, <laughs> Choose not to answer them or to No, no, one. they're great questions. I mean, I only had about half an hour to speak, so the oh. issue of foreign uh, interference is, is certainly a, a, an important issue. Obviously, the elephant in the room is the United States, which has been Egypt's closest ally, which backs the military with $1.3 billion in annual aid. And uh, there's a widespread view that they supported the Muslim Brotherhood. I think the United States uh, wanted a stable <laughs> partner to work with following the chaos of Mubarak's ouster. And it saw a large political player with a massive presence on the ground in the Muslim Brotherhood. And saw that I think this group could work to further its goals. What are the US's goals in, uh, in Egypt? They are to maintain uh, access to the Suez Canal for US warships, maintain overflight rights for military aircraft over Egypt, maintain the, the peace with Israel and border security with Israel. So things that have very little uh, to do with what Egyptians want, but everything to do with what the United States perceives as national security objectives in the Persian Gulf. Uh, and I think the United States uh, was very happy with Mohammed Morsi when he uh, negotiated a ceasefire in November uh, between Hamas and Israel, and uh, overlooked uh, the constitutional declaration that Morsi did in 2011, uh, sorry, 2012. But yeah, I think you have to realize that Morsi was never invited for a state visit to meet with Obama, which is the crown jewel of uh, state diplomacy. So there was always, I think, some ambivalence there, and they were trying to see if this was a group they could work with. Uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of conspiracy theory over the role of the United States in all of this. I think they have been bumbling their way through this, trying to figure out what to do, giving out contradictory statements and so forth. So, uh, I hope that answers some of your questions. The second question was about uh, Tamarut? No, it was about... No, so I didn't say that the military was afraid of the Islamist uh, popularity. I said that the, the non-Islamist parties, the so-called liberal groups, uh, have a vested interest in eradicating them because they can't beat them on the electoral playing field. I agree any astute political observer or politician should have known that the military would take over when it did this. You're right, the Islamists were losing massive popularity. The Muslim Brotherhood was doing itself in. It, I mean, it was, we didn't need to do anything. So I think we don't, we don't know yet I mean, if elections had taken place, would they, how much would they have lost? But I think a more natural course may have been uh, the way to go. But, so well, I don't think the military was afraid of the Islamists, but it was the liberal parties that wanted to eradicate them. As for tomorrow, I mean, this is something I've tried to investigate, and it's a very hard issue to, to crack down. What I meant to say was, I, I, I think it began genuine, okay? It began in this atomized, uh, decentralized, genuine, authentic signature gathering campaign. I mean, there was Facebook pages and all the Mahafzal to people going out and gathering signatures. And where, at some point, the security services saw this opportunity. And they backed it. They backed it financially. It was being distributed in government offices openly. So Wiedis himself said that he, in a New York Times article, that he funded uh, Tamarod and gave them offices from his uh, Free Egyptians party in different governorates. Uh, they were clearly, at the very, very least, given a green light to do what they were doing. Which, uh, any activist knows you don't get, usually. Uh, but at, or at the most, they were actively funded and embedded in later stages. And, you know, they, they swallowed it whole. And these guys who were, became the leaders of Tamarut, uh, their comments have been more royal than the king, as it were. They, you know, completely backed the military. They find themselves and I can understand the seduction of power. They find themselves sitting with Tom Tom, with uh, Sisi, and with all these people making these huge decisions. We're going to oust Morsi tomorrow. And suddenly you feel you're important. You're on the 15-member committee. But this is a very pernicious way of co-opting this ge uh, genuine movement, which is what I was talking about, is a very, uh, I think, dangerous uh, outcome of, of what we've seen over the past few months. Yes. Hi. Um, I just have one question. I mean, you were talking about how um, the new government led by CC is 
uh, experiencing a wide flood of applause and that everybody's kind of just embracing the army. And I was wondering how you viewed the third Midan movement and all those other, like, I mean, the, I know that they're very small scale, but I feel like these movements, particularly with the uh, last week's protest by the al Kahlewi, are a bit of an indicator that it's not really a clear-cut, you know, Muslim Brotherhood versus the military type dichotomy. And um, it's basically, I just want to see how you see these movements. No, I mean, uh, I'm sorry if I painted such a grim picture. <laughs> I think those movements are very important. I went to uh, the Third Square protest on, I think it was July 26th, uh, in Medan Sphinx. Uh, there have been people speaking out. My, my point was more that mass mobilization has uh, gone kind of more towards the army uh, and, and is orchestrated by the army, and I think that that's dangerous. Mass mobilization used to be this third way that chose neither of these two political forces, and it's been shrunken down into, you know, what, what's sad for me is that when the revolution began in January 2011, I felt for the first time that there was a whole society that, that was with me and that agreed with me, and I wanted to, I preferred being out with people than being at home reading a book for the first time. And uh, that has slowly been chipped away until even within members of my own family, I speak out and I'm attacked you know, by all forces. And I feel like I know 20 people that I agree with now. So those movements are very important. There's figures like Amr Hamzawi, who has proved to be a true liberal, who has spoken out against uh, you know, both of these kind of authoritarian regimes. I'd be very curious to know what someone like Bessem Yusuf is going to do on his show. Uh, that is starting for the first time on Friday. I wrote a column yesterday in a shuru, uh, saying that he was going to take Sisi to task, although I don't see how he's going to ridicule Sisi the way he did Morsi. Um, but groups like the Ultras, uh, April 6th, uh, the Revolutionary Socialists, and lots of independent groups, and, and, and a lot of them formed this uh, revolu what, what was it called? Tariya Saura. Uh, this was in late September. A very loose umbrella group uh, to find a way forward. I just think it's a very difficult environment to affect change right now uh, until we wait for kind of some people on a large level to sober up a little bit and, and to forget about this crazy wave of chauvinistic nationalism and Muslim Islam and stuff like that will hopefully go away. Uh, I wanted to know your opinion about the attack on the revolution. I mean, perhaps uh, one of the strengths of January 25th, so there was no centralization, uh, there was no leader, there was no one to attack or jail or take out. It was a very organic movement. Uh, it also was a problem after it, it achieved its biggest success in toppling Mubarak, in that there was a very conflicting ideologies within the movement, and it allowed the military to emerge as kind of the strongest partner. Uh, you're right, I mean, tomorrow, t but I think, I mean, there was genuine mobilization to war against Morsi that was culminating in these June 30th protests, and the petition itself was very, very simple. It didn't have anything about a transitional whatever. And it said early presidential elections and a vote of no confidence in the president. It is much easier to destroy a movement when it is coordinated, to co-opt it, which is what they did. I think that the military even appointed these people, or not, or Mukhabarat, or someone named, I mean, I don't know where Mahmoud Badr and, uh, and Mohammed Abdul Aziz came from. Tamarut started very decentralized, it was all being picked up, and all of a sudden these are the three guys that represent Tamarut. And these three, and I think someone should do an important history of who they are. Uh, but it was a very effective mechanism of, of taking the movement. But also on another point, I mean, if you look at other revolutions in history, they were very centrally, centrally controlled, Bolsheviks and, and so forth. I mean, and those, successful or not, have more been the history of revolution. Uh, but, you know, they, they often turn into other things. And another point is the problem is the, I mean, the danger is, is that there's a, there's a very fine line between revolution and 
chauvinism or fascism, right? The same problems and grievances give rise to both. Uh, you know, problems of, uh, of hunger, of, of equity, of things like this. So it can either blossom, as is what we saw in January 2011, or it can descend into this blaming of the other and demonizing someone and blaming them for your problems and act, calling for control and order. Uh, and that's, I think, the direction that, that we're seeing people trying to push the state in right now. So. I see. I, so you're, you're, I mean, the Sinai is a very uh, difficult issue. To, I mean, like you're saying, it's very hard to get information and really get a sense of what's going on. But I guess I, I've been very confused by it myself. And I guess that I was wondering if you could just give a sense of the best of our ability about what, what the parties are and what's actually being what's actually being fought over. And you know, in the, in the sense of you know, I mean, I, I don't think anybody really knows what the security services role actually is in the Sinai or what the different part but I, I, I it, it seems like this you know it seems like this area that's outside of Egypt and is and treated as outside of Egypt. Um, and I get I just wanted to get a sense of anybody has a sense of what this is actually about. because um, a lot of you know a lot of the problems you know, Hamas or whatever uh, you know it's like what um, what's the history of this? Yeah I mean one of the best people on that is actually Lina Atala. I don't know if she's spoken. Yeah, she can. She's great on, on Sinai. But um, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said it's a region that appears outside of Egypt. The states neglected Sinai completely. So uh, they have very poor services, water, electricity. All of these things are completely neglected by the state. They're demonized as militants. Uh, you know, remember in, in the bombings in Chalmers Sheikh, the security forces came in very hard, arrested hundreds of them. Uh, people just randomly families and tortured them and so forth. So there's a lot of anger uh, and there was a lot of violence in the January 2011 revolution <laughs> against the police uh, in Sinai itself. And I think, uh, and of course, I mean, there was a flourishing economy in northern Sinai that was uh, happening with the tunnels, uh, mm -hmm. with Gaza. But this was, you know, an underground economy that benefited a uh, uh, select few and if you ever go there, it's you know very kind of barren and very poor, and then all of a sudden you'll see this garish, awful mansion out of the middle of nowhere, and that's you know one of the tunnel overlords who has all his money. Um, but I think you know the security services have long uh, attacked people in Sinai uh, very viciously uh, and clamped down on them, and especially. And there's no question that there's a degree of genuine militancy uh, in Sinai. And uh, so I think the response to um, you know, these kind of political events has been, they, they do, they have attacked a lot of, I mean, we, don't, we can't prove any of this, but every day it seems a policeman is killed or an army officer is killed in Sinai. Uh, we don't know what the extent of civilian casualties is. Uh, but it just seems to be kind of this endless cycle that is not going anywhere. I mean, I, I didn't really answer anything of your question, but <laughs> I don't really know much about it. Uh, oftentimes, people define a revolution as a serious change of control over assets and resources. That hasn't been the case. Is it still a revolution, and is it ever going to happen that way? I mean, I agree. I mean, you know, the. Uh, the main call of the revolution was Aish uh, Haraya bread, freedom, social justice, and two of those are essentially economic demands, bread and social justice, uh, and it goes to the heart of, of what people are fighting for. Uh, I think an essential point uh, is that the military controls something like 30% of the economy. We don't know because it's completely transparent. Uh, and they act as a state within the state with its own economy. They even lend the government money, which is ridiculous. Uh, so, unfortunately, the, the group that was elected to power, the Muslim Brotherhood, didn't vary its economic policy whatsoever. Uh, in, in very specific ways, it pursued many of the same policies that the Mubarak regime had pursued. Uh, We've seen movements on the ground that try and challenge this, and, and workers, uh, uh, you know, engaging in a lot of strikes and calling for economic justice. The labor movement wholeheartedly supported the June 30th protests with the Egyptian Federation of Independent Trade Unions and the Democratic Labor Congress, the two 
big independent trade federations that came after uh, 2011 supported uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the protests against Morsi, but they have also, to some extent, very been very supportive of the military. Uh, and it's almost like they've forgotten what the military did while it was actually running the country. Uh, you know, criminalizing work stoppages and strikes, even sending in soldiers to undermine strikes, uh, and uh, cracking down very hard on the labor movement. So, you know, I, do I think it'll ever happen? I think that's part of kind of the essence of the revolution. If that happens, then we're, we're getting there. Uh, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic we're going to get there anytime soon because the people who are in charge and have power uh, are enjoying popularity. Not working if the world turned upside down. Well, the world turns upside down on January 25th, 2011, on January 28th. It's turned upside down. I mean, that is what revolution is. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, been righted up again, but hopefully we'll... Yeah. So, uh, thank you. That's been a really great analysis of the last two and a half years. I want to ask the question more about the future. Um, how do you see, uh, I, I hear very little talk about the political process and a new political process. We hear about the Constitution, but very little, if anything, about a political process. And I, I wonder if, um, if having presidential elections in, in mid-20, 14 is, is, is even a smart thing to do. I mean, you can look at uh, more recent um, revolutions, South Africa, Portugal, Spain, um, and the fact that they took a, quite a long time to set a, a very long, you know, a political process that was more uh, fair and balanced and, and really uh, set out a kind of even playing field so that new political parties could grow and establish themselves and um, and everything that needs to happen to have uh, you know a, a fertile political process that is fair and balanced so how do you see the future in terms of that and where do you think you know what what would be the best thing in, for Egypt's future from because we have to go forward from here uh, in terms of a political process that might give us the, ch uh, the chance of having um, something other than the NDP and the MB in, in the number one and two slots. And I, my feeling was that part of the reason that occurred was because the, the elections were forced through so quickly that no political process was able to be put in place. And if we repeat that again, we're going to have the same outcome. I teach here, one of the one, first questions that my students ask me is, why does the United States only have two political parties? That's true. They have, I mean, even though there are more than two, but, but it's, the illusion, but of it's the illusion of choice, exactly. So are, is Egypt repeating this same mistake that was made? Is it going to be repeated again, and how can it be repeated? Uh, you know, I, I never, I can't predict because Egypt is so unpredictable. So I, you know, I tend not to try and say what, what I think will happen. But what has happened is that all we do is we go vote. I mean, if you look at over the past two and a half years, we've gone, we voted parliament, uh, sure council, president, uh, two referenda, and. Over the course of all these votes and elections, the legitimacy of the state was just decreasing. So, and to their discredit, the Muslim Brotherhood only saw democracy as as the ballot box, right? So your role as a citizen is to go cast your ballots, and this is what you know most governments and people in the United States try to do. Your role as a citizen is cast your ballot, and then you go home and you're done. You have no input on state policy. You cannot petition the government uh, to to you know, fulfill your political goals, you're done. And we are the people who represent you, and we're going to kind of go through. So there's a real problem in uh, viewing this very procedural, uh, having a very procedural view of democracy, in, the, in that you just go and vote, and voting is everything. And if you look, the current transition 
they're egging, they're, they really want to do a referendum on the Constitution to legitimize this process somehow. Uh, I think it's no, no, uh, it's not magic that the, the two people ended up in the runoff were Ahmed Shafi and Hamid Morsi. Elections take money. They take money, they take networks, grassroots networks on the ground. Uh, you can't just have a concept and an idea and something like that. It's, it's dirty. I mean, that's what, a, that's what campaigning is. And so they have these networks and they, and they won. It will take time for uh, other groups to do so. What's not encouraging is that they don't seem to be interested in doing this at all. They don't seem to be interested in building uh, genuine kind of knocking on doors and building up funding and patronage networks and this kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I feel, I mean, the plan is we're going to be going to the ballot box again. What's sad is that I feel that most Egyptians don't care that much uh, as they used to. Remember the first vote in Parliament, everyone walking out very proudly showing their ink-stained finger and so forth. By the time the runoff came, it was just like, like this. And then I can't imagine that this time there'll be much enthusiasm for it, which is, uh, you know, right or wrong. And, and furthermore, like I said, the army, right now we're voting, we're, we're playing these civilian little politics, right? But if any of these civilian politicians elected uh, decide to challenge the army, they're just going to be combated or removed. I mean, so it's almost this fictional game we're playing where there is this final person who's overseeing us. And this may be enshrined in the Constitution as as the army being the decider of the people's will, right? And not the ballot box being the decider. Uh, and this is very dangerous because while this was the de facto state that we were living in for 60 years, it's going to now be de jure and it's going to be in writing. Uh, and all of these things like the defense minister having to come from the armed forces, that always happened, but now it's in the constitution. Uh, the no oversight over the military budget happened, but now it's in the constitution. So they're they're kind of enshrining this new political order, and I don't think any level of elections and the voting is going to get rid of that. It's going to be have to be some uh, movement from the ground. So I'm just going to take one more question. Uh, I'm sorry. You mentioned earlier that the same conditions that could lead to a revolution also could lead to a to chauvinism or fascist state. And also you mentioned your own pessimism over the potential for people to sober up at the moment. No, I, I so, think they, they might at some point. Well, actually my question is, uh, by your estimates, what could be like a candidate for a wake-up call or a kind of a breaking point in the foreseeable future? I don't foresee it very soon. In the foreseeable future, since nothing is changing. Well, I mean, well, I think the economy is a very important factor in this. If people's lives don't improve, uh, they are going to start holding those in power accountable. Sisi does enjoy this godlike status now, but I think if anything that we've learned from the revolution is that the Egyptian public is a very fickle partner, and they can turn in a second, uh, and they have done on, on political figures. So, you know, and I think people are feeling strangled. I mean, this curfew is really affecting a lot of people. Trains just started, but I mean, this was really affecting a lot of people. And if you look at the economic plan that the government has, it's it's the same reliance on outside cash injections from uh, allied states, in this case, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and Kuwait and stuff, uh, to prop up this impossible budget that we have. So eventually, these things are going to crumble. And the question is, will people, you know, rise up and start to, to hold those in power accountable and hold the real people in power accountable, the military or whoever is kind of in charge. I don't know how long it will take, but it's uh, what's, what's discouraging for me is, is the, the discourse has been poisonous. Uh, and you know, even with friends and family, so many people are justifying this crackdown to get rid of the scary Islamists. Whereas, you know, if you remember, everyone's like, they, once they get in power, we're not going to see them for a million years, you know, they're, gonna, they're never going to leave. But, yeah. Within a year, there was protests everywhere. And so, I, what worries me is kind of the language that's happening around this and the support for the army. But again, Egypt always surprises me. They can turn on a nickel, and hopefully it will, but I don't know why. A piastre. A piastre. A piastre. Okay, please join me in thanking Shaykh Abdul